Um, because I want to convince you that we've done a good job, and we are doing a good job in creating uh, a set of standards that will work for the community. Um, so, standards. Um, I think we, we take standards for granted. We rely on them all of the time in everyday life. Like we rely on the fact that we can plug our phones into the wall, that we can plug our phones into our laptops, and things just work. Every time you uh, request a web page, you are using um, dozens of software standards, let alone all of the standards that are, are, are uh, about the design of the hardware and of all of the servers and infrastructure. So we just take them for granted because generally they're just there and they just work. Um, sta so standards are really important. Um, they're extremely important when we're thinking about how to publish, access, share, and use data. Because there's an infinite number of ways in which we can structure some information. There's an infinite number of ways in which we could choose to connect together two different applications. So if we, if we want to do that reliably, if we want to make sure that data can be used and shared across a community, if we want to make sure that we can plug two applications together and that they will work consistently and reliably, uh, reliably uh, we need to put some work into standards. We need to kind of understand what the plumbing is required in order to make that work. Um, so because it's such an important part of the exchange of data is why we've had a standardization activity as part of Open Active from day one. So that work has been in two halves um, as, to match the kind of two, two stages that we've talked about earlier. So we've looked at standardizing um, the uh, open opportunity data and we've looked at standardizing how to uh, enable people to become active participants by making bookings in, um, in booking systems. So that's really important because um, we're, here, you know, we're here to um, uh, encourage you to publish and share uh, open data because we think it will create new opportunities, create new um, uh, innovation, to create, uh, get people um, more active, to get them to attend the sessions and use the facilities that you're offering. But in order for that to happen, the data has to be available in uh, consistent ways that other, other organizations can use and reuse confidently. In order for those people to become participants, to be able to make bookings, um, we need to be able to connect different systems together. And you need to be confident um, whether you're the, the innovator creating some new application or the, uh, the organization providing the booking system. You need to be confident that people are doing the right things, that things are happening in safe, secure ways, that um, the data is being accessed and used and shared in the, in the right way, etc. So we, we're kind of trying to put, do the groundwork here to reduce some of the unknowns, to answer some of those questions about the technical aspects of sharing and, and using data. Um, and then it becomes clearer to everyone about what, what is involved in participating in Open Active, because you're clear about what's the technical commitment, what do you need to do to implement the support for the program in your applications and services. Um, and hopefully, we're also creating the space within which um, we can innovate and explore commercial opportunities. Um, because we, as we've seen already, we hope that by making the opportunity data more available, it will drive traffic to existing uh, events and facilities. And that by having a way to book, um, uh, place bookings, it will allow existing platforms, services and products to better integrate with one another, as well as creating an environment in which uh, innovation can happen, that could be, we can explore new ways for um, sharing and using this information. So we're, we're, we're trying hard to kind of create that space with the technical standards. So it's about the plumbing. It's, about, it's not a, res a restrictive environment. So the way that we're doing that is by trying to work in the open. Um, so I said there's lots of, lots of standards used whenever you're uh, um, requesting a web page. Uh, Rich has already mentioned uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee. So when Sir Tim, 30 years ago, uh, as of like, a few weeks ago, he created the first web page, he shared his specification, his standard for doing that with the world. He left it as open and then worked with a, a community of early adopters um, to create an, uh, extensions to that standard and make sure that it worked for everyone. We're following the same process with Open Active. We're working with the community to build the technical specifications that we think will enable the innovation that we want to see delivered as part of uh, the wider program. Um, and we're, 
we can see that uh, working in the open uh, in lots of different ways. So all of our draft documentation is available on the web for anybody to look at, um, to f provide feedback on, and we provide multiple ways for that to happen. Um, all of anyone can come along and raise an, an issue or concern. They can suggest some technical improvements and engage with the work that we're doing. Um, pretty much every fortnight, we have an hourly call, uh, video call, where we have a more technical discussion around the scope of those standards. And we even uh, record those. You can see like two years worth of Nick and I and lots of people in this room getting into the detail about both the opportunity data uh, and the booking specification, where we've been working through some of these issues. Um, and we do that so that we know that everyone is going to engage with this work in different ways. Not everyone wants to get into the technical details. Um, not everyone can participate at, at, at every call. But by trying to share as much as possible, we create an environment where everyone can contribute. And then hopefully we can create uh, standards and specifications that will work for the broader community. Um, and it's taken us a while to get there. I always underestimate how long it takes to kind of build consensus around uh, standards. If we just went away and did it as a technical exercise, we just, you know, the, the Open Active team just went into a room and created a specification, we probably could have done it in a week or two, but then we would have created something that was unlikely to work for the range of different uh, systems and business models and, and ideas that you all have. Um, so it's actually taken us, I think, about a year and a half on booking. Um, so the journey for creating this specification um, started quite some time ago. And the groundwork we did was to, was to do some due diligence to see whether we even needed to create a standard at all. Um, so we looked at, at what existing standards, what existing APIs were available. But we didn't feel that everything, w that, there was, um, that all of the requirements that we had were kind of ticked off by some of that existing work. So we've been trying to build on those foundations, but uh, create things that will work for this community. Um, we've run workshops like this where we've got people together to uh, scope out what, what should be in the first version of that specification. We've run um, uh, periods where we have prototyped and explored what uh, um, early versions of those APIs might look like with um, some, uh, some of the people in this room just to understand more of the technical nuances. And then we've been doing the hard work of iterating the spec, engaging and trying to build, build consensus. And as a result, uh, we've created something that I think um, is stronger from the, from because of the contributions that we've had from the community. So where we're on, on now, we're at the stage where we're coming to the end of the, the development of the first version of the, of the specification. So there's a few things that I want to take away from today. First thing, I want, want to make sure that you feel comfortable that we're doing the, the right things, we're focusing on the right areas, and get a sense about what other things that we might want to put into this specification further down the line. Because this isn't just a, a do this process and done, it's an iterative thing. In the same way that we've iterated the, uh, the data model for the um, opportunity data, we expect to iterate on the booking spec as well. Um, we want to know what questions you have to help us move forward to the next stage. What do you need to know in order to be comfortable about adopting this specification, either from a technical point of view or from a business point of view? Because the end result is, the goal for us here is to not create lots of technical standards, it's to get people active. So it's to get those standards implemented. And so if there are barriers that we haven't thought about yet, then we want to uh, understand those and work with you as a community to solve them. So that's where we are. Thank you. Now, unfortunately, you're going to have to listen to me for a bit of time now. I apologize for that. Um, I will try and keep this interesting and engaging as much as I can. Um, there's some stuff in here that's less interesting. Uh, you can thank Phil White from Place for People. We're going to talk about tax for about 10 minutes. Uh, thank you, Phil. But that's you know, really, really good. Um, to, we get into that detail, right? Because we need, these are important issues. And so um, there's a number of, uh, a number of topics to cover. Um, and so uh, before I do that, I just need to press a button on here, which is going to make the AV go a bit. A bit weird, so give me a second. Um, and then seamlessly, not so seamlessly, I'll try and press that. There you go, that was seamless, wasn't it? Okay. So, just to qu quickly recap what we've already talked about before lunch. Um, and I'm sure you've already got this, but open data and booking are two separate things. Open data is step one, booking is step two. Quickly run you through this again. This is what it looks like if you just have open data. That's great, there's signposting. There's a limited amount of instrumentation and measurement we can do around it. 
but it is very useful and we do encourage everybody to open up their data. The second step to that is choosing your partners, is booking. And that's creating this full end-to-end -end user journey where we can instrument and measure everyone across the whole thing um, and where we can create this really seamless experience for those customers. And that looks like this. Instead of that button that takes you to the website that may take you a few extra clicks to get to where you need to go, there's a book now button that is integrated into the experience of that third party. So you can get to this point of putting your email address and card number in and pressing go, and that's done. And maybe even if you've already put your, you've maybe already logged into an app, you don't even need to put in your email address because it already knows that. You may have your card details stored already, so you may not even need the card details. If you're using Apple Pay, you might be able to use your thumb and you don't even need to put that information. You can just use your thumb and press pay. So, so it's super seamless, and that's what we're really looking to achieve here, so that end goal. So with that in mind, um, we're going to talk about some slightly more technical things. Um, this is a big list of bullet points, which you're not expected to read because there's too many words on the slide. Um, however, what it does show you is that there's a bunch of stuff that we put in scope on the left-hand side, and there's a bunch of stuff that we put out of scope on the right-hand side. Now, out of scope doesn't necessarily mean out of scope forever. There are some things that we'll talk about that are out of scope by design. Um, but there are some things that we've just said, you know what, for now, we don't need this to be included in order to move forward. We can probably get away without this thing um, and we can create a great experience and engage all the various innovators and, uh, and, and data users uh, that we need to engage. One of the things that we've been really thinking about with this distinction of in scope and out of scope is we want to make sure that the maximum number of available business models uh, are included in this. So you can do whatever you want to do with booking. Um, that's the idea anyway. If you're an innovator and you want to do something with um, a subscription-based model or you want to do the, I don't know, you want, to, you want to use nectar points or you want to use you know, a different currency, whatever you want to do, that is, that is possible here. Um, we're not that, so, that, so this is designed from the ground up to not put any restrictions on the kind of experience we're creating. Um, and that's really important because our, the whole point of this is that we don't know what, as to Sean's point earlier, the next Steve Jobs in his bedroom is going to come up with that's going to be brilliant. And as you would well imagine by the number of people in this room and the fact it's taken us a year and a half to get to this point, Steve Jobs in his bedroom is probably not going to be able to add a feature to this very easily. So we want to make sure that from the beginning, that whatever that, that chap has got in his, in, in his or her mind to, um, to, to, to create in the world and to, to get people more active, that they can crack on and do that. And then off the back of that initial proof of concept, go and get investment for it and make something amazing. Or maybe if they're a, a big corporate that is you know, someone running a campaign in the corporate and they're just trying to get someone in their team to back them on this, they can go and do that. It's not just about entrepreneurs, intrapreneurs as well, um, but anyone with a good idea, anyone with an existing campaign. So. Some stuff on the left, some stuff on the right. We're going to talk about some on the left, as all on the left, and some on the right today. Um, so to, to kick us off with something uh, that will be a good frame for this conversation. So this is what we call, we call actors. So in booking, these are the people that are involved in the process. And um, we're going to reference these terms throughout, so just to kind of get you familiar with this. There's a customer. That's the end customer. I know in, in the context of the room, I know people have, you know, you could be a customer of a booking system, you could be a lot of different types of customer. When we say customer, we mean the end user. Um, broker. Broker is the third party, is the innovator, is the, is the person who's is changed for life. It's Barrington England. It's those organizations that are using that information. They're, they're a broker in this scenario, and the reason they're a broker is because they're enabling that connection to happen. They're enabling that booking to occur through them. Booking system. Um, it's, uh, some booking systems are probably a lot more than booking systems, uh, totally acknowledge that. Uh, leisure management systems and other systems that run entire uh, leisure centers and, and more are uh, included in this bucket. Um, but we've called it booking system to keep it simple because it keep, it, that, that is everything from you know, British triathlon sign-up system, for example, or, or British cycling sign-up system, all the way through to you know, a full-blown kiosk-based you know, whatever system that you might have in a, in a leisure center. So that whole spectrum is included in, in booking system. Seller. We're using seller because that's Google's term for it. That's schema.org. There's some standards-based reasons why that's the name we're using. Um, but it's, so seller just means provider in this context. It means the person who has the event or the, the yoga class or the squash court and wants to have people book that thing. So that's a leisure operator or that's your Zumba instructor or that's your... Um, uh, school, if it's a school hall. Um, and then we've got payment provider. 
So payment provider is, a, is an organization that is, of all of the organizations, the payment provider is the only organization that has to interact with both the customer and the seller. And the reason for that is that due to various security and other legislative reasons, you need to make sure that if you put in credit card details somewhere, they're going somewhere safe. Um, and, and that's what the payment providers offer, is that end-to-end. That -end. PCI DSS compliance is the, uh, is the official term for it, if um, you're familiar with that. Um, and, and what payment providers like Stripe, for example, let you do, if you haven't heard of Stripe, um, they're a marketplace payment provider um, that offer this exact service. There are many others to choose from. <laughs> is they give the, the broker, the, the innovator in this case, a really, really secure, easy way to add payment to their website that, is, that, they, that they have, they've assured, and with, with their you know, billion dollar companies in some cases in, in, in that box, they've assured will work, will be secure. And they provide that, and they also provide to the seller a means of getting that money back out. So you can say, um, you, take, you take a payment, the broker takes a payment, and that money gets deposited into the seller's bank account. Um, and, and so that's the role that they provide. Um, and like I said, there are, there are many of those. And they're distinct from uh, the booking system because the booking system in the context we're talking about here is responsible for the, the booking. So there are five slots, now there are, uh, or the five spaces, now there are four. Um, does that all make sense? Is that the payment provider that the seller uses? So the question was, is that the payment provider the seller uses? Uh, it, yes, but it doesn't have to be. So for example, if, if um, a payment provider, if, if a ledger operator was using WorldPay, uh, it might be that the broker would be happy to use WorldPay. It might also be that they would want to use a different provider. Um, and that's because not all of the options that that broker might want to explore in terms of payment will be supported by WorldPay. For example, the pay with your thumb, uh, Apple Pay example. Um, just a quick um, note, actually, that we should have said it before. Um, if anyone has a question, Great that you do. If you just put your hand up, and what Richard will do is he's going to grab that microphone and run to you. The reason for that is the people on the live recording uh, won't pick it up otherwise. Should we keep questions? There's chat questions chained up. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's still good to you know, make sure that you're all getting it as we go along. So um, thanks, Rose. That was a good question. So uh, booking flow. So first of all, does that all make sense? The nods in the room, does that all make sense? Great, okay. Um, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is just the, is the flow. This is the most, again, the fundamental thing. These things seem quite technical, but it's important that you've, you, you, you understand them because they're the fundamentals to how this all works. And hopefully we've done our homework and uh, this is what you'd expect to happen. There are always three steps in booking. Select, register, book and pay, three steps. This is a case across everything that you will interact with online in general. It doesn't necessarily have to be the case that there are steps that you see. It might be that you talk to your Amazon Alexa and say, or, or your Google Home and say, hey Google, can you book me a squash court? Um, it might pick one for you. That might be the select stage. Nick, I'd like to correct you on that. I'm going to talk about the microphone, but register is not mandatory. Uh, register is not mandatory. Yes, I'll, I'll get to that, yes. Um, you, we probably should change the word, actually, if, 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 that, if you're thinking of that double meaning, yes. So, uh, Sean, uh, at the back, for those who are um, listening to this, just said uh, that the register is not mandatory. That's a, that's a good point. Uh, and I'll explain what we mean by register here. Um, so select, and, and register is the point where you identify the person. So maybe we should call it identify. Um, rather than register, because you're, you're totally right. It's not uh, that the person is registered permanently. Uh, we're talking about a guest checkout. Great feedback. Um, so, so step two, register or identify the user. So however you've done it, somehow you've conveyed to the system, again, it could be your Apple Watch that it knows from your, your, your Apple ID. It could be any, any way of the system knowing that that's who you are, um, so that you have an email address. And that, that's, that's all that's needed, really, to make the booking. It's just that information. Um, and then the final step is, is book and pay. And that's the bit which is also that this is optional because not all activities actually have payment. So the payment element of that is optional. Sometimes it is just book. Um, but this step is, is generally where someone commits to a thing. Um, generally speaking, they'll want to see what they're committing to. 
So there's usually a page which says, you know, this is your checkout, this is what you've got in your basket. It's not necessarily the case that you need that page. It might just be a simple thing you're asking to book, um, in which case it'll be a, just a booking confirmation button. Um, but in any case, there is an extent to which someone is committing at some point to, to doing this. Um, so select, register or identify, um, book and pay. Anyone else? Uh, could you raise your hand if, you, if there's any other questions about, or, or not, not obvious objections to that three-stage model, other than what Sean said? Great. It's, it's unrelated, but can we, Sorry, access, can we access the slides afterwards? Yes, you can absolutely. Sorry, Joe, you can absolutely understand the slide. Yeah, you can access the slides. The reason, the reason why we're asking you to speak in the mic, by the way, is because there's a, there are people listening in. So just so the people listening in can hear what you're saying, it's very helpful. Those viewers at home. As a question over there. Um. If you have guest registration, so no data passed, how do you eliminate credit card fraud? Because it would be simple for someone to come in as a guest, use a stolen card, turn up, use facility, leave. Um, so that's a great question. Uh, and actually, we can answer that right now. Um, the great thing about organizations like Stripe is that that is exactly part of their function. Um, so Stripe, using only an email address and a credit card, um, do exactly that. Um, and they, they have a, a big team working on how to solve that across the internet. Um, they're in used by hundreds of thousands, um, if not millions of websites. And so um, that, I, I guess I would say that's, that's in the box of a payment provider's problem, rather than something that we need to worry about here, because the payment providers are very well versed at, at solving that, if that helps. Does anyone have any, but particularly with this three-stage model, any issues with that? So. Thanks. Just as a local authority provider, um, when the money hits our bank, it would go into a holding account for the council. Then we would need to move that money into the budget of each building where the bookings are. So at what point would we be able to get that information sort of reported back? So I think it's probably best that we cover that in the payments section. So we can, we can but we will absolutely cover that question. Um, so um, it's difficult because there's a lot of inter intertwining bits. So I'm aware that asking this question so early on, uh, but just in, it's just in terms of those three steps. <laughs> Getting consensus on the basics. <laughs> we'll get into the detail. Nick, just, just quickly on the register bit, picking up, following up from Sean, obviously that's a organizational decision as to whether or not you allow a guest checkout or in the current climate, you want to try and gather as much data about people as possible so you can then further communicate to them. Obviously, you're talking about here about the broker taking this data. Do we get on to later what data you are passing through actually onto the booking itself? Absolutely. We have a whole guest checkout section, so that sounds perfect for that bit of the conversation. Um, thank you. Okay, on that basis, I'm going to assume that we are relatively good with this, and we'll definitely pick up those two questions. Thank you, guys. Uh, oh, one more. Um, where you need to make, uh, where you need to actually gather data on the user before you actually allow a booking, like say, like what we were talking about earlier, where you, where you needed um, things like uh, gender for like certain certain options, is that sort of thing going to be incorporated into this? Let's pick that up with guest checkout. Yeah. It's a great, great question. Let's pick that up. So the guest checkout is. We'll, we'll come to that. We'll come to that um, before the next um, big, big Q and A. So, to so there, are, there are just there are multiple Q and A points throughout the presentation. Um, so it's really great that you've got lots of questions. Can we urge you to try and get as many of those questions into the Q and A points as possible, just so that we can stick to time and cover everything that we need to, to get through? And put them on Slido. Yeah. 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 So it's yeah. the same same exercise we went through earlier. We'll be running the same that, that exercise a couple of times through Nick's presentation. Sorry, I have been asking. So in fairness, they've uh, they've been answering. Um, but but yes. Um, but 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 and you're you're totally right. The, the big the, the generic questions of which those last three were, um, we've got. We'll pick up and we'll we'll do as part of proper Q and A. Um, great. Okay. So um, moving through this then. Um, so this is the the so back step. We have agreed that these are the three steps. There's some detail around che checkout, but these are the three steps. Great. That's consensus. So. These three steps laid out like this, uh, and, and I'll explain how they work in the booking journey. This is the journey going from the top to the finish line when you've completed the booking. Um, so you select, first of all, the thing, and, um, and at the point where you select, there's a checkpoint. I'll explain that in a second. Then you identify yourself. At the point where you do that, there's another checkpoint, 
and then you book and pay, and that's, that's booking. So I'll, I'll explain what these things mean in a second um, and why the checkpoints are there. Um, before we do that, just the, on the payment, the way that we make sure that people don't pay for something before they've booked or book before they pay, because there's a really important thing that you need to get right with these systems, that you don't have people who have paid for something that then doesn't happen or the other way around, take a place that doesn't. Um, it's, it's something called a two-phase commit. Basically what it means is it's like an interlocking. So someone says yes on one side, then someone says yes on the other side, and then there's a final handshake to say, great, let's do it. So you need yes, yes, let's do it, the three steps. And so the way we have those three steps laid out, as you can see there, are there's an authorized step, and then there's this book, and then there's a capture. And that's the, and that's the final OK. And what that means is that with, with all payment systems, you can, you can do a two-step of authorizing capture. Authorize means reserve the funds that you will need to spend on this thing. If it's a flight, if it's a hotel, or if it's, in this case, a squash court, you should reserve those, that £15 pounds in the, the, with the credit card. And all, all apps that you're using will, will do this. So you'll, you might, if you're using Monzo, you might realize because it tells you. But um, they'll do that in the background. And then, so you reserve that money. Then you commit to the booking. And it, it says to the system, we're going to book. And the system says yes. And then at that point, you capture the payment. That instructs the credit card to, or company, or whatever payment method you're using, to then take that information. Um, and so, uh, so to, take that, to take that payment. So we, that's the, the, the route we've, we've chosen to do here. There is another route, you can, you can, another way around you can do that, which is you can do the authorizing capture on the booking side. The reason we've chosen this route of the two available options is that it's the simplest thing for the booking system. And I think this, this really tells you what we're trying to do here, to create the simplest possible standard that should be the easiest to implement for all the parties involved, um, but particularly for the booking system. Because what we've seen is that, that we want to make the barrier to entry really, really low for especially all the technology providers. Um, and so, um, not saying it's super simple, but just saying that it, we're trying to simplify it as much as possible. So that means that the complexity is on Stripe or on any of those big, massive companies that already do this. Um, and that's kind of that's our objective there. So that's what that is, authorize and capture. Um, and then we come to the, what these checkpoints are for. And so um, I don't know if you've ever, ever realized, but when you're on Amazon.com and you put something in your basket, that thing that's in your basket isn't actually yours until you give them your credit card details and press the pay button. So, so if there's only one book left on the, on the virtual shelf in Amazon, then someone can pinch that from you uh, if you're not quick enough through the checkout process. So if you compare that to theater tickets, actually, so that was Amazon on the right, Theatre tickets on the left of this, of this screen. If you wanted to book for Hamilton, for example, and started putting your details in, there's a little timer that appears in the top right. As soon as you've picked your seats, before you've even entered your name, it's already reserved that space for you. It's reserved those two seats for a five-minute period. That five minutes increases to 20 minutes, and then you put your credit card details in, and then you complete. And there's a, there's a middle ground, which is what you have in a lot of the flight operators. You'll see with seat booking on a flight, this is United Airlines. As a travel step, where you, you can see that their four-step process there, you put your travel data in, that's your, your personal details, and then you select your seats. And so that's called, what we call named, uh, named lease. So all of this is, is a lease. So in the case of, um, in the, case of the theater booking, it's a lease that you've got over those seats for the, until you complete that payment. In the case of the uh, airline, it's a named lease. So the first one's an anonymous lease. The airlines are named lease, so that's the, you know who they are. You're going to lease on that basis. And uh, Amazon, there's no lease. You, you don't own it until you own it. Um, and so uh, before I actually talk about what we've done here, uh, I'd be interested from the room, a very quick poll, um, if we could. Uh, how, who in the room, so just regardless of what you do, right, you might be a data user, uh, you might be sorry, a broker, you might be a, a leisure operator. What experience would you like to see the leisure sector have, do you think? Do you think the leisure sector should have a, oops, sorry, um, do, you, do you think the leisure sector should have a um, Amazon style approach uh, where there's no leasing at all? Do you think there should be um, anonymous lease like theatre so that you can start and, and you've got that, those two seats, you've got that squash court as those details are captured? Or do you think that there should be named leasing? Um, so yeah, on Slido, if you could quickly just vote on what you think uh, you would like to see in the travel sector. Um, 
in, sorry, in our sector, not the travel sector, <laughs> in the physical activity sector. Uh, and, uh, and those online, we've realized that there's a 30 second delay. So you won't see that slidey thing for another 30 seconds. But when you do, it'd be great if you could click it. Uh, we've got 31 people voting. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll get to 50 again. Nearly there. It's a, it's a, big, it's a big question. Um, and I suppose there's pros and cons, isn't there? Because if it's a lease, if it's anonymous, then it's basically the first person that gets it, gets it. So you're guaranteeing that thing is sold. But if, it's na if, if there's... Um, sorry, if there's, no, if there's no lease, you're guaranteeing that thing is sold. If it's like shopping online, you're guaranteeing the thing is sold. It's more important to get it sold than for the good customer experience. Um, with anonymous lease, it's the maximum customer experience. So we care more about our customer experience than we do about getting the thing out <coughs> sold. Um, I'm so fascinated to see what the answer is to this. Okay, let's see what they've, uh, they've voted. Interesting. Wow. And all people online will be bumping this up as we go, because um, it's 30 seconds later. So that, that's actually, that is really interesting. So it sounds like we value customer experience. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> By a hair. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So clearly we should, yeah, we should base everything on this. Um, and it's, yeah, and the online people are, are still going. So, um, it looks like then no, no lease, so it's the extremes, isn't it? Can you see? So it's one extreme or the other, and then some people are in the middle. Uh, great, okay. And more online people saying, no, it's just that one. Uh, Sorry, this is a dumb question. I don't know if there's a difference between anonymous lease and named lease. So, a name, so to be clear, a named lease means you need to get their, their personal details first. So you need to say, you need to enter your uh, email address, then click next, then it's reserved. Anonymous is from the get-go, so you can still type your email address in. And yeah, okay, cool, great. Sorry if that wasn't clear. So uh, okay, thank you. Um, right. So you'll be pleased to know that because of that exact split, which we expected to happen, um, we've supported all three of the options in the specification, um, and so that is the reason for what I'm about to explain. Um, and so what that means is that when you, when, when you enter at any of the experiences, I, I might use a website occasionally just to simplify it for the conversation, but to be clear, it could be an Apple Watch, it could be an Alexa, it could be any number of things. Um, so let's not focus ourselves on websites because that's not all that's available. Um, however, it might be that on that, on that experience when you, go, when you hit that page, um, you, you want to capture that person and say, you know what, yeah, we're going to reserve that thing for you. Um, that's what checkpoint one is. So at checkpoint one, what happens is the, the broker says to the booking system, um, this is, this, I want this. And the booking system at that point can choose to provide a lease or it can choose not to. So, it's, 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 so it works that way around, if that makes sense. So the broker says, someone wants this. The booking system can either go, great, or it can go, cool, here's a lease, depending on what the setting is. And then the next step, as soon as you've got the person's name, or email, sorry, email address, um, as soon as you've got the person's email address and any of the other optional fields you can capture, um, then, you can, then the booking system does another one. It says, OK, I've got the person's email address now. And then the booking system can either say, great, or it can go, here's a lease. And so those options are there. And then what happens is at the booking stage, regardless of whether there's a lease or not, uh, it will attempt to create that booking. If there's a lease, it's obviously more likely to succeed. If there's no lease, then it will try anyway. Um, but then it might be a chance that, that you'll have a little error message that comes up and says, sorry, the thing was, was available, but you were too slow typing your email address, and it's, it's gone now. Um, and so what this means is that this, this setup allows both sides. So if you're a broker, you can support the whole lot if you want to. And if you're a booking system, you can support the whole lot if you want to. Um, and it will just figure it out every time there's an interaction as to what's supported. Then it will give you the best possible experience. Um, but if it's the case that you're sitting there as a booking system or as a leisure operator, and you're thinking, we don't want to bother with if, there's an, if, if, if it's going to cost us more money or whatever it is or extra time to support leasing, we don't want it.
great, well, that's fine. You can do that later. And there's no cost, there's no, there's no issue down the line upgrading to supporting leases because it will just seamlessly start working. Um, so does that all make sense broadly? Great, some nods, wonderful. Sorry, that was quite technical, um, but hopefully you can see why and that's worth it. So um, the next thing to talk about is roles and responsibilities. If there's any questions on that previous thing, please hit Slido and in a, in a couple, we're gonna go through two more sections and then we're going to come to those questions. So if there's any, anything that you're thinking of. Oh yeah, and upvote if you like someone else's question. Uh, so roles and responsibilities. Um, this is quite an interesting one. So we went around and debated this quite a bit back and forth. And so hopefully you'll um, like what we've done here. Um, this is a, uh, a kind of bit of a Venn diagram, but a bit weirdly drawn. So apologies, it's, a, it's not quite your normal Venn diagram. Um, but basically this talks about those, those actors we talked about earlier. You remember the broker, the booking system, the payment provider, those things that we had on that slide. So that's what this is showing you. It's showing you of these things in the middle, which we'll just talk about now, order, invoice, payment, refund, who looks after them and who can see them, who has any knowledge of them. So broker at the top, uh, you can see the blue line. So the broker has knowledge of everything. The booking system has knowledge of just orders. The payment provider has knowledge of the payments and the refunds. Um, and the broker has the invoices. So the system of record is the second line. The system of record, the broker has the invoices because the, the invoices are stored in the broker. Whereas with the others at the bottom, you can see the booking system stores the, the orders and the payment provider stores the um, refunds. So it can see both and do both. But the broker is the only one with the overall picture. And the reason for that is that we wanted to make it really flexible so that whatever the broker is trying to do, they can do it. Like I said, if they want to spend nectar points, if they want to use employee wellness vouchers, if they want to uh, do a monthly whatever, like who knows what they might want to do. Um, maybe it's based on how much the, um, the digital tracker you know, tracks them in a given day and they get some points to spend, whatever it is. Um, they can do that. Um, and the invoicing being generated by the broker allows for that. So however you want to package up your, your, your service and, and the, the, sorry, the broker wants to package up the service and provide it, it can do that. Um, the orders need to stay in the booking system because the booking system is a system of record for what things are booked. Um, the booking system might already generate invoices in other scenarios, um, but for this scenario, from a legal perspective, the invoices would be um, with the broker. Um, and then the payment and the refund stuff, that all sits with the payment providers. We've mentioned PCI DSS. You want that stuff to be safe with payment providers that know what they're doing with that stuff. So they will be the system of record for that. Um, those payment providers will need to have a relationship with both sides. They'll need to have a relationship with the um, broker and also with the seller because we mentioned the money comes in one and goes out the other. Um, and so both sides have to be happy with the payment provider selected. Um, ultimately, that means that both sides can probably access that information. The seller can use the payment provider to access that information if they wanted to. Um, so, yeah, so that's kind of where the responsibilities lie. Invoicing with the broker. We could have, and we spent a bit of time going down this road before it got really, really complicated really, really quickly, um, put the invoicing in the booking system. And if you do that, what happens, to show you kind of where we, we got to with it, what, we, what happens if you do that is you go, well, okay, so we need to account for payments and refunds because they're on the invoice, so you need to make sure that they're all they're in, in there. And then what if you want to do something like add an extra fee on here or take a commission off there? Well, that needs to be in there as well. Or what if you want to um, do a different, use a different currency or use some, you know, like we mentioned, um, credits or something? Well, okay, we need to put that in there as well. Um, and there needs to be a version of the invoice stored every time it's changed. So legally, you need to maintain different versions for cancellation. That needs to go in there as well. And what ends up happening is there's a huge amount of extra work that ends up on the booking system's plate to deal with. Um, because all this complexity, all this diversity, all the amazing things that you can do as a, uh, a broker ends up being something that the booking system has to account for and think about. And it becomes this enormous thing. So booking systems in the conversation, you can listen back on the W3C calls if you're interested in that uh, history. Uh, I can't remember what episode, sorry, um, but it's in there somewhere, uh, said that, um, yeah, well, that, that's, that's nuts. We don't want to do all of that because 
you know, that's not, we're not getting value from that as a booking system. We're not getting value from dealing with all of that stuff. And li likewise, on the broker side, um, the brokers want to do what they want to do, right? They don't want to be limited by whatever the booking system has, happens to have implemented. Uh, and so this kind of, what this does is say, we'll put the diversity where it exists in the invoice bit. That's, that's where the diversity exists. Let, let that be on the broker side. And then um, the booking systems can do the bit that's the same across everything. Uh, which, which hopefully massively simplifies it. Um, does that make sense? Broadly. Great. Okay, good. Um, I haven't actually put a poll on this one, uh, which I possibly should have done now, given the last, the president for the poll on the previous one. Um, but if anyone feels like they really want the booking system to, to, to process invoices, stick a question on Slido and then upvote the heck out of it, and we'll, we'll cover it in the Q&A. Um, uh, yeah, because that's that's a you know we that's a good discussion to have if we want to have that discussion still. Um, so uh, that means that the receipts and notification stuff also sits with the broker. Um, so to to kind of so the same I'm going to say the same thing again when I say it slightly differently. So the invoices are the broker, the receipts are the broker, but therefore so are the notifications. But if you think about it, that makes sense. So what we're saying really is that the booking system isn't going to send any emails to the customer. Those notifications are going to come from the broker. Hopefully those words are landing. So there's no, there's no direct email that goes. So it, might, or it might be that normally when you're booking through your leisure center website that the email comes from the booking system. But what, what we're saying here is no, it should come from the broker. And again, the reason for that that's come out of the debate is the broker is where the person interacted in the first place, right? They've gone to Change for Life to make the booking. That's where they've got that, that conversation. They've talked to their Alexa. That's where they want to get the response from. So whatever medium they've used, and it might not be email. It might be notifications on a, on a smartphone. It most likely would be. Modern apps tend not to email. It's all notifications. Um, those notifications can be used to tell them about cancellation, to tell them about completion of a, of a refund, to tell them about... Uh, any of the status changes, if the, the event's cancelled or postponed, the receipts and notifications, uh, that, that's the broker. So the broker has that um, conversation. Um, and again, that allows for the diversity of the mediums. So if you've got lots of different ways that a broker can interact with a person, um, it's on the broker to make sure that happens. So that does mean there's a bit of trust here, right? Because the booking system and the seller are both going to notify the broker of that cancellation. So we're going to have to trust that the broker actually delivers that. Otherwise, we're going to get some annoyed people turning up on site. And so there is a, there's an element of making sure that we're comfortable that the broker that you're the working with, those partners we're talking about choosing, are partners that are competent and will provide that level of service. Um, but we think that, that that's worth doing because it's the diversity of what that allows in terms of innovation is, is worthwhile. And that's, that's where we've come to so far. Um, so again, any any questions on this, please do um, hit Slido um, for that. Um, and so to put that on this diagram as well, um, that means the receipts and notification stuff, that is, that is on the broker to, to deal with. So the broker is where you would store the invoices. Um, and again, that makes sense because if you're on, let's say you're on Change for Life and you've booked a number of sessions across a number of providers, maybe you've booked a, um, a school hall for badminton one day and maybe you've booked um, a Zumba class the next in, in, your, in your operator's website, then um, across both of those, you'll want to see your stuff in one place. You've booked that on Change for Life. You want to go on Change for Life, for example, and see you know, all the bookings I've made, see all the invoices, see all the information, cancel them in one place. And so that's what this, this allows. It says that's all in Change for Life. Um, great. Nearly there until the question time. Um, so hopefully that's uh, a, lot of, a lot of detail about how all the organizations work together, how, um, how brokers work specifically. <clears throat> Stay with me for two more minutes, and I'll give you another two diagrams, and hopefully uh, we'll, we'll then get to Q&A. Um, so Phil, this is your time. <laughs> we're going to talk about tax, and we're going to talk about relationships. Um, there is an entire section of the spec dedicated to this, uh, and it's very important that we do that because tax exemption is a huge thing. A lot of operators get that exemption. A lot of their customers benefit from that exemption. What that means for those who aren't aware is if certain, in the UK specifically, certain organizations of, certain, of a certain status are allowed not to charge VAT on 
their activities. And that means the customer pays x VAT. Now, if we do this wrong, what happens is the customer pays VAT, which puts all your prices up by 20%, which is not what the customer wants. And it's also going to create a lot of headache um, in trying to account for where that goes. Um, and so this is actually already solved. It's solved because there's two main ways in law in general, not just we haven't solved it. This is a problem that exists in other places and has been solved. Um, it's called the agent model. And this is actually how a lot of things already work. If you work with an estate agent, or maybe not an estate agent, other types of agent um, that, uh, get, that enter into contracts um, on behalf of the seller. That's, that's how this works. So, so that's what an, an agent is defined by, a party that can enter into a contract on behalf of a seller. That's what you're doing when you're saying, you can be my agent. Um, and and that sense, that the sense of agent is something that is common. Like I said, it's, it's in law. It's something that is well understood in contracts and in legal work. And so that is what we're saying is, is one option here, option one. Um, for how you allow your broker, or, or as a broker, you interact with uh, the seller and with the customer. In this relationship, and again, this is, these, these terms are actually straight off Wikipedia because this whole area is so well um, uh, developed. So the agent broker actually sets up that relationship, that top relationship there. So all the agent broker is saying is, I have permission on behalf of the seller to sell you the squash court for £15. Do you want it? They say, yes, you go, great, done. That con contractual relationship exists between the customer and the seller. So, for example, if, if Badminton England is selling, as you saw earlier on the Badminton website, uh, a Badminton court from Fusion, which was the actual example that we showed, um, then what's actually happening behind the scenes is that Fusion is the seller, Badminton England is the broker, and they are saying that you can enter into a contractual relationship with Fusion if you go through that process as a customer. And so what that means is by the time the customer's pressed book, put their email address in and completed that, that contractual relationship exists with uh, Fusion. So if there's any issue, if you know, someone, um, if the terms and conditions apply, you know, someone falls over, all that stuff, like it's, that's, that's a normal contractual relationship, just as if they walked into your site. The only difference is it's been facilitated by the broker. Because it's been facilitated by the broker, that means that you can, you can do other things, like you might charge, you know, there might be a commission in there called internal commission or external commission or who knows what. There could be other, other charges going on outside of that. But the point is that doesn't matter from a, this is how all these things work. It doesn't matter uh, what other things there are going on. That £15 has got to go from that customer to that seller. After it's gone there, there might be a commission payment. If there is, for example, that could go to the agent broker. But that's a separate transaction and it's accounted for separately. And that's how Stripe works, that's how all these things work, that's how across um, two-sided markets, across various sectors, that's how it always works. Separate transaction. And so in the background, there's a 50 pound transaction, and then there's a minus whatever the commission is that comes off and comes back, if that makes sense. So it's two separate things. Um, so that's one model, that's the agent model. And I, I suspect, uh, from what we've, we've learned, um, that this is probably going to be the most popular of the models without doing a poll. We could have done one here as well. Um, mainly because you get your exemption, right? You want the exemption. Probably it's something that you would, you would choose to, um, to go through and, and do. But there are organizations in the sector, I think Pay As You Gym is one, um, that do another model as well. They do some, this sometimes, but they also do this. And this is the reseller model. You might be familiar with this. Again, it's something that exists across all sectors. The reseller model is, quite, is a little bit different because you actually purchase the thing. So as an agent, you, um, sorry, as a broker in the middle, you purchase that squash court. You purchase it from the seller, and then you resell it onto the customer. You might resell it a millisecond later, or you might resell it in a month. It might be a tour that you're booking up, and you want yoga for the tour, you know, for the whole tour bus, and, uh, and this is part of what you're doing. So you, you, know, you book 10 spaces of yoga and you fill the bus and you fill the spaces at the same time, right? These are models that we're allowing for because, of course, that's the innovation we want to see. This could be built into Airbnb. Why not, right? Um, but obviously, the challenge with this is that you're, if you're doing that, if you're filling your tour bus, then you have to buy those, slot, those spaces up front. And if you're doing that, you're a business buying. And if you're buying as a business, you don't qualify for the VAT exemption. So you have to pay the extra 20%, which might be worth it because it's an all-inclusive tour and maybe you're making your margin somewhere else and maybe that's okay, right? But that's, that's the decision that's open. Um, and as, as a seller, there's no reason why you couldn't take both. You don't need to choose. And as a booking system, it's no extra complexity to implement both. It's just a case of there's, there's a thing that you can, you can choose which way it works and it's just audited which way you're doing it. 
And so we, it's in the spec and the way we're, we put it together is we'd encourage everybody just to support both because um, it looks like they're the two major ways that most people do business in the world. So in this, in this respect, so we might as well support both. Um, so as you can see, seller, um, the, the reseller purchases from the seller, the reseller then just afterwards um, allows the customer to purchase from them, separate transactions. We got there. <laughs> okay, good. Um, and again, any, any questions uh, on this, again, uh, if you could put them in Slido, that would be great. If there's anything that's not clear, or otherwise we can jump back to it. Um, and uh, the last, <laughs> two more slides. They're not, they're not crazy diagrams, you've seen them already, so don't worry. Um, uh, tax calculation. So a tax calculation, this is something else that came out quite strongly from the, the, the different things that we, uh, different um, uh, meetings we've had. Um, people don't generally trust tax calculations. It's very complicated. Apparently everyone wants the uh, booking system to do this because the booking system is designed to do this kind of calculation and it's very difficult, um, uh, which uh, w makes sense. So the way that the spec currently works um, is that the booking system is responsible for the tax calculation. Uh, which means that whatever that, that, that tax that's, that's, uh, you'd expect to pay is what you pay uh, th regardless of the route that the, the, the broker is using or whatever currency they're using, right? Um, it might, uh, uh, from a legal perspective, as long as the VAT is in pounds, you can put the currency as credits or whatever you want. So this is what people are currently doing. Um, and you can do the same here. Um, so the tax calculations with the booking system and the broker gets that information and uh, can then display it, store it in the invoice, get the money, et cetera, all the, all the stuff that they do. Um, so again, that's something that we, um, uh, if you have strong thoughts on, please do put them in Slido and let's, uh, let's, let's, let's talk about that. Um, uh, the alternative to that, which we, we talked about, was baking in the information to make that tax calculation into the spec so that you could give it the rates that are, uh, that are uh, required. Bearing in mind, tax works internationally, so its sales tax in the US works differently to how tax works in the UK. And there's, so there's a lot of complexity that we could put in to allow that calculation to happen on both sides. Um, but the strong steer we had was that even if we put all that information in, that broker would probably do it wrong, because it's quite complicated. Um, and so not to try and overcomplicate that. Um, but also, a lot of the booking systems that already support tax have that logic in them, so it's no extra work for them to do it. So that was their thinking. We're already doing this. We'll just do it for them. It's no extra effort. The broker, it will be extra effort for the broker to figure it out and, uh, and something else to audit and check and all that stuff. So um, that's the tax calculation. That happens in the order. So the order includes tax. Um, when, you, when you get that invoice, you then include the information from the order in the invoice. And oh, yeah, uh, quickly, we've accounted for net and gross tax bases which means that the US, it, this works in the US and it works in other places. Um, but for those of you who aren't aware, if you go into a supermarket in the US um, and you go to uh, a checkout, the, the checkout and take your bread to the checkout, you will find that there's extra sales tax added at checkout. In the UK, that doesn't happen. In the UK, the price you see is the price you pay because the VAT is included. In the US, it works differently. Um, uh, and actually, it changes across states. And so what we've allowed for, and I don't think Australia as well, um, works similar to how we work. So what this allows for is that, again, uh, uh, both are available. I know some systems are international uh, systems, so you have to think about how this works for you guys. Um, and this is very simply supported. You basically say, as a seller, this is the type of tax that you support, and then everything has to be that way. And that's generally how people seem to do it. If, you, if you're a leisure operator, you probably just do everything in your accounting system one way, and you don't have different alternatives. But if you're a booking system, you might have customers in Canada, you might have customers in the US and, the, and in the UK, in which case you can allow your customers to select uh, what, what they can do. And as a side note, we've been building all this on top of Google's schema.org standards, which I kind of mentioned earlier, which means that internationalization is built in from the beginning. And so all of this stuff should, in theory, work in other countries. Uh, all times have time zones, prices have currencies, uh, etc. So all of that's in, included. Phew! Goodness me. Um, okay, so hopefully that was uh, all made sense. Um, so it would be great now if we could, I know there's a lot to digest there, um, and there's a lot, a lot, a lot of bits. So 
Um, hopefully there were some things that stood out to you there. And, and I guess what we're really looking for here is if anything you went, oh my goodness, that's, that doesn't make any sense. Um, that's what we're really looking for specifically capturing here. If there's anything you just looked at and thought, well, there's no way that works, um, please do put that in Slido. And if, if someone else agrees, then please upvote that. Um, and uh, alternatively, if there's something in there that you just, I didn't explain very well or you wanted to have clarified, um, then please put that in Slido as well. Um, so if you could talk again in your, in your tables, uh, as well as just putting that in Slido, if you talk in your tables about those questions, and that might lead you to other questions or it might lead you to the answer if someone else on your table maybe understood what I was saying uh, or, or didn't. I don't, yeah, probably because I'm explaining it badly. Um, so uh, yeah, if we could do that for five minutes that, now, that'd be great. And then we'll come together like we did last time and go through the questions. So we're going we're gonna to start answering some of these questions. We're going to have a break at 3 o'clock. So we will answer as many of the questions as we can between now and 3 o'clock. Um, we may not be, be able to answer every single question in that time, but we have a record of the questions that have been asked. So we will get back to people where more information is required or where you've got feedback that, that we need to hear. Um, so I will lead us off with uh, a question slash statement from Stephen Winfield. The booking system needs to know what has been paid as it's the master database and is what we reconcile to. Yes. Um, so, it, it, so it will do. It will know what has been paid in terms of the um, amount of money that... So we mentioned that the amount of money, including tax, uh, is in the order. And that's the, amount of in, that's the amount of money that will be in the, uh, the, the invoice and will be available within the booking system. Um, what won't be in there is the, uh, if there's any commission or anything separate, that would be separately um, reconciled out of band. But however, that is, is, is best done with, um, I guess, accounts department or um, the particular broker, if that was a thing. Did you actually want to do your, your quick summary on the... Ah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, uh, yes, I do. So uh, there, was a, there was a quick question that someone had, which I thought it might be easier just to answer by showing you one slide. Um, and that is, I'm going to do this again, sorry. Um, just press this button. Um, so there's a, uh, if it wasn't clear early, and I apologize for this, um, everything that you see on the screen is bookable the spec allows you to book it. So it allows you to book events, sessions, facilities, um, you want to, um, leagues, ringers, courses, online classes, except for Roots. Roots isn't bookable because they're Roots. Um, every, every, all of those, you can join a league, you can, you can, um, you can book a squash court, you can, et cetera. Um, so if it wasn't clear, that this is, uh, it, it encompasses all of that. So, great, sorry, carry on. Cool, so back to uh, slightly second question from Chris Hunt. Dynamic pricing is marked as in scope, but subscription-based pricing is out of scope. Can we use dynamic offer as an escape hatch in the meantime? That's a, that's a, that's a question who, from someone that knows the spec quite well. Uh, where's Chris? Hi, Chris. Um, yes. And you know the answer to that because you've been in the conversation about it. So. <laughs> oh, I see. OK, that's a very good point. Yes. Um, so we actually was going to cover dynamic pricing in the, in the next uh, section. So maybe what I'll do is make sure that's in the next bit that we talk about, um, because you're absolutely right. There is the, it does allow for subscription-based. Um, uh, to, be, to be clear, what, what isn't in scope um, is uh, it, there are, uh, there's a type of subscription-based uh, um, uh, interaction that we've seen that, that is the case where you would, for example, move GB do this. They give a... Um, a card to members that they can walk into the center and use. Do you see what I mean? So you're not booking online, you're walking into the center and using it ad hoc. And that's not what this is about. This is a guest checkout, so that's separate. But this still allows you to guest checkout based on the subscription, which is what the question was about. Yes. So before I ask the next question, just a reminder, if you, if, if you have questions that are coming up in your mind as we're going through this, put them in Slido. And even if we can't answer them now, we can get to them another time. Um, so a question from Chris Phelps. Is there any interest in having membership products open too? Or does the myriad of product types and features make this unsuitable for direct comparisons? That's a great question. Um, we have in our future roadmap on not the, um, 
on this specification, um, but the opportunity data specification, which includes the things on the previous page that we, we the slide that we sh saw there. Um, uh, yes, that does it. That that has got the potential to include membership pricing, um, and maybe even in the future you could go ahead and sign up to a membership. Don't know, but that's a whole other because there's direct debit involved and other things. Um, but yeah, if that's something that, that we we would like to see as a community, um, please do upvote that, and and we can we can take that as a good hint that we should be looking at that actually in the next in the other spec that we're doing in the parallel track. Um, but I think I think that's that would be hugely valuable. I think uh, it's just a question of prioritising it. Another question from Chris. Um, are we also looking to publish facility data? Facility data, For example, I want to find uh, 50 meter pools near me as I'm training for a competition and the standard 25 meter is too small. Yes, uh, as the previous slide, which uh, I'll just um, try and switch back to if I can, uh, says, yes it is. And uh, particularly, uh, the facilities stuff. So all the squash courts, all the yoga classes, yeah, all of that is exactly part of this. And we'd expect the booking uh, implementation, it, it's no extra effort to include both sides. Great, uh, next question uh, from Matt Coxhead. Whose site are the participants reg registering on, the brokers or booking system providers? Good question, the broker. So the broker is where that, that um, we talked about there being um, that notifications, that engagement, that relationship, that's with the broker. The brokers look to Change for Life, the broker books on Change for Life, um, so they are registering with Change for Life. Um, and we'll come on to guest checkout in the next section, um, but basically that email address goes through to the booking system, so the booking system still gets the email address. Um, and we'll also come on to marketing preferences in the next section um, around that, but, but yes, uh, it, it, it would be with the, with the broker. Is that what you wanted? Yeah. Great. <laughs> OK. Um, well, the questions are reordering live as we go. Um, <laughs> oh, I saw. Just take that one step further. You, you might go. Um, hopefully, I've got this right. In that situation, say um, Change for Life were sending the notification or the confirmation of the booking. Um, say it was a real beginner product that the seller had a really good understanding and therefore the terminology that was used in that marketing and that confirmation e email was very specific. Hmm. Um, is, there, is there any thought around that? So the way we speak to our audience is, is very, very specific and by, that could almost be a weakness from our point of view of passing it over to the broker? Hmm. Yes, kid. Okay. okay, I'm trying so hard. To <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Um, and, uh, and as a weakness, I suppose you mean because you might be describing uh, with a triathlon, I presume it is, uh, certain terms around sign up and what you're expecting to see on the day. Um, well, the, all the information that the broker has to, to display the event will all come from the open data. So that's the descriptions, the times, the prices, but you know the, the rich imagery, all the stuff that you've put around that, um, the attendee information that they'll receive before they go to the event. So um, I guess as a, a seller, you'll have the opportunity to put all of that information in as, as richly as you, you want to include. Um, and uh, I suppose if the broker is creating a good experience, they should really be using that information and, and, and presenting that, that activity in the right way. Absolutely, so it's, it's how you work together and, and that, that partnership, so I suppose that's, and that's why the, you know, the, the brokers are kind of are partners really. You make sure that you kind of say, this bit in my open data is really important, you need to make sure you use it, because as we said earlier, you get that additional level of, uh, with, with a booking conversation, you have complete control as the seller. So you can, you can ask for things like that as part of that relationship. Whereas the open, it's, you don't, it's a bit of a different thing. So we might have just answered that next question, but we'll ask it again just to be double, doubly sure. Um, so will questions from the booking system be transferred to the broker site? For example, event organizer specific questions. That's, That's a great question. This current spec doesn't include random, like not random, important questions. <laughs> um, they're not random. Uh, very important questions that might be asked uh, and, uh, and that, was, that was by design just in terms of scope and, and the staging of it, so thinking about things that you can sign up to without asking lots of questions at the moment. Um, in the future, absolutely, totally aware that there are lots of examples of activities where those questions are vital 
uh, for participants to, to, you know, to, to fill in and, and for the activity to go ahead. Um, what we'd recommend at the moment is that you can, I mean, assuming that we don't want to put this in scope and, and please um, write that on slide, we're not putting the heck out of it if you want to, to have that conversation. Um, uh, at the moment, what you can do is you can say, take the booking and then you can follow up um, out of back, you can follow up separately somehow um, with the relevant questions. And that's something you can talk about with your brokers um, because obviously, as we mentioned, the broker is a conversation. And there's no reason why you can't do more than this. This is just allowing you to do the basic amount. Question from Jamie here. Um, who decides what user information is sent to the seller when a customer books? Um, the good question, and I know why you asked it as well, because Jamie was in the W3C call where we, we brought this up. Uh, and uh, so specifically, the way this is currently set up is that, um, and again, this is the next section on guest checkout, which I feel like there's going to be a lot of good conversation about. Um, the uh, only mandatory field, only required field in the specification as it stands is email address. And that's because uh, we'll talk about in guest checkout that that's the kind of across the board what people seem to be capturing as a minimum to meet, make the most efficient booking process possible. That's from a spec point of view, that's from a system point of view. If in your contractual relationships or your, your partnership conversations you want to ask for more than that, of course you can ask for more than that. It might be that as a, uh, a, a seller you say, I'm only going to work with brokers that also capture this. Um, and there are other optional fields in the spec, um, which are, include full name, surname, uh, and telephone number, which you can also ask for. Um, at the moment, there's no, well, you could, you could actually ask for more, and it could be a custom thing, but within the spec, uh, there's not more than that, so we don't go as far as capturing date of birth, and that's just to make sure that we're clear on the scope here. This is about a guest checkout. Um, when people ask us to capture date of birth, it's usually because they're trying to do something with memberships, which this is not supposed to be. Um, so, uh, and, and it's not, it is, this isn't about joining, figuring out that a member that's booked through Change for Life is already a member in your platform through some checking across the numerous details they might supply you. You know, we don't want you to start capturing their national insurance number and, you know, comparing it. Um, this is about saying, you know, if they've got an email address that matches, great, you can use that and that's, that's good for your CRM. But don't, you don't need to capture more than that um, because the point of a guest checkout is the, the user doesn't expect more than that, if you see what I mean. The guest checkout user experience is a guest checkout user experience. So the user sh wouldn't be expecting you to have matched them. That's helpful. Um, so a question from Laura here. Could you implement a couple of the lease options depending on the booking type? A couple of lease options. Could you implement a couple of the lease options depending on the booking type? Do you mean um, do something different depending on what the booking type is? Where's Laura? Thanks. Depending on what you're booking through like a different operator or provider or seller, you, you might want to use a different lease type. Um, so I might want someone having 10 minutes to complete a booking because it might be quite popular. Um, and that makes other people drop off a system generally as well. And right. also causes massive frustrations for customers. Yep. So could you use various different lease types for different product areas, say? Absolutely. Yeah. There's nothing to stop the spec. The spec allows for that. Whether your booking system implements the feature is a, is a different question. So it might well be that the, the booking system actually only allows a, a coarser level, uh, you know, a, a more kind of high level option of what, what you can allow. But yeah, absolutely, the spec can let you do that. Okay, I think we've got time for maybe two more questions. Um, so I'm just going to go to the two that are top of my list. Um, so another one for Chris. How are multiple currencies supported? Could I pay in dollars, euros, Bitcoin? Uh, but the ledger center get GBP. Absolutely, yes, you can do all of that. Uh, and the, and how, how is it done? Um, it's because, as we mentioned earlier, um, the amount in your order is in your currency that you, you've defined, um, and that the broker is the one instructing the payment provider to take that payment. And as long as the payment provider deposits the amount that it's expecting to reconcile into your account according to what the order says, and do you remember you're reconciling the amount in the order, against what's in, the, what's in the bank account. And there might be a commission with that set. And so, um, uh, yeah, if, you, if, you, if they wanted to do it in whatever currency, Bitcoin, and do that, and, and, and as long as the money comes back to you and it's still £5.50 when you've asked for £5.50, it doesn't matter what they've done on their side. That's the beauty of having payments separate is that they can, they can innovate with that. Okay, la last question, and just a reminder, there are other questions in this list, and we will get back to the people who put those into, into Slido. Um, but the last question for now, we'll end on a tax one, because we love tax. Um, if an individual hires our facilities, 
the VAT rate is zero rated. However, if an organization hires facilities, the rate is 20%. <coughs> so perhaps more of a point of clarification rather than a, a question. Is the question that, yes. can you apply that and have so a variable rate? That's right, so, that, so exactly. So the specification actually um, does that. That's all it does, but it does do that. Um, by, what, what I mean by that is, um, if an individual, um, hang on, no, one sec. No, sorry, <laughs> doesn't quite do that. <laughs> if, an, if an individual uh, d does the booking, that's the normal process. Yes, that's a, that's a B2C transaction, business to consumer transaction. That would be the VAT calculated accordingly. Um, we have left space in the specification. If you take uh, a business detail and you say, this is an organization, what you can do as a broker is you can say, I'm an organization. The booking system can say, great, therefore here's the tax. So we've got to that level. We haven't put any specific guidance around it because it gets really complicated. If you're both in the EU, then you get 0% if it's instead of 20% if you're in different countries. When we do Brexit, who knows? Um, so like, there's a whole load of other stuff in there to worry about. But, um, but, but yes, it does. In, in theory, yes, it does that. But again, it will depend on your booking system support for B2B transactions because it is part of the spec, um, but it's not something that it's, it's required to support. Okay, so we're going to draw a line under the questions there. Thank you very much to everybody for, for, for all those questions. It's really helpful for us to hear the kinds of things that are going through your mind. Um, we're going to break now for 15 minutes. Um, so if we can be back here at quarter past three. Um, are we just breaking in here? Or we... uh, so if you, if you go upstairs, there's tea and coffee upstairs. Um, we can get out of the room for a bit uh, <laughs> and away from the slides.